Thanks everyone for joining us today for our, our first webinar for the year. Um, we're very fortunate to be joined by Guy Webb and Torben Heinzel from Lone Bio. Uh, we've got a, about an hour or a little bit longer if, if questions run a little bit longer, but about an hour uh, we'll have some presentations from, from both Guy and Torben uh, about what Lone are up to. Um, and they may run through reasonably quick, um, but don't don't worry if you miss a few things because we'll actually upload this this webinar onto our YouTube channel uh, at the end of it, so you can go back and actually have a look and and uh, catch up. So just a little bit of housekeeping. I just make sure that everyone's microphone's muted, um, and uh, as we go along, feel free to throw some Q and A, um, some questions into the Q and A box down the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll get those answered towards the end in the Q and A session after after Webby and, and Torben have have finished their presentations. So, so thanks for for joining us. Um, and I'll hand over to you, Webby. Thanks, Dan. Very good. Thanks for everyone joining us in virtual land. Um, yeah, just a quick introduction. We'll break it up into two parts today. I might just give a a quick overview of the actual science and the, the technology that we're looking at. And uh, Torben will talk about what that means for starting carbon projects and what um, that whole carbon project world looks like. Um, just as a real flying introduction, I guess um, we've come uh, a really long way in the last three years, um, but it's been a, a you know 11-year process up to date to get up to this speed. Um, but uh, in the last three years, we've uh, been able to develop um, two products that we've brought out onto the market, uh, being uh, the carbon builder products of uh, barley and canola, um, which is a technology that we can um, inoculate onto seeds into the soil, fungus that uh, allows carbon sequestration to ha happen uh, much more reliably and a much higher uh, sequestration rate than uh, we previously could before. It's on the back of uh, some early research out of Sydney Uni um, a bit over a decade ago. Uh, that was taken up by um, myself and a few farmers in the early days as a not-for-profit uh, research institute called Soil Sequest, which uh, some of you still uh, have uh, active participation in and are still alive and well and going well. Um, that spun out a... Um, a uh, company, a uh, for-profit company called Loam or Loam Bio um, that took on um, a lot of investment money, uh, venture capital money, plus uh, some institutional money from uh, JDC and CSIRO. Clean Energy Finance Corporation um, has helped us out um, to date uh, for this project. Um, we've raised something like $155 million dollars uh, which is an extraordinary for the Australian startup. Um, and that's allowed us to do a really comprehensive research and development program to develop this technology, which uh, basically is a, you know, potentially a, a world change. Carbon uh, point of view offering opportunities growers to not only improve their soils, but um, to actually um, monetize the carbon uh, in their soils for the first time. Also adding another um, enterprise stack into the current enterprise mix. So Lime's footprint um, has grown really dramatically. I was just in a seminar this morning. I'm just on my way back from Moree at the moment <clears throat> and um, in a seminar with Holly the Moree farmers and we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, where this has come from and how fast it's travelled. I remember in... Uh, 2016, looking at a balance sheet for Soil Sequest, we had uh, something like $12 in the account. Um, now we've grown in that period of time uh, to 120 people around the world um, and uh, you know, multiple research uh, facilities, uh, not only in Australia, but over in um, Minneapolis, Maine, Portland, a um, whole heap of places in the States, uh, Calgary in Canada, and now in Sao Paulo down in uh, Brazil looking at the sugarcane soybean market down there. Um, it's allowed us to expand field sites um, all around uh, the world. Um, we'll have, um, have many all sorts of field sites from small plot trials to strip trials, glasshouse work and so on. 
One of the reasons um, <clears throat> we've been able to take this technology from um, basically zero to hero in, in three years to getting a product to market so quickly is our ability to collaborate with other research organisations around the planet, um, people that are um, advanced uh, organisations rather that are really advanced in their spe uh, uh, specific fields of research has allowed us to amplify the speed and the professionalism which we take this technology globally. Um, so there's a list of a few of them that we're, we're working with um, that has really allowed us to take this product uh, to another level and really um, validate the, uh, the, the information that we're taking to growers. Um, so the new technologies uh, that we're talking about is this uh, carbon builder product that we've named, um, which is based on a fungal endophyte. Um, so endo meaning inside and phyte meaning plant. So in simple terms, it's a fungus that lives inside the plant uh, in a mutual relationship with the plant. And that uh, mutual relationship means that the fungus is helping the plant and the plant is helping the fungus. Uh, so we're uh, able to improve the health and productivity of the plant by use of this fungus whilst it's sequestering carbon, which is the, the key thing. So both a canola and a barley product are out on the market with uh, wheat and pulses and other crops uh, in our research program uh, to come out shortly. So this gives you, this is a great slide because it gives you a really quick flying overview of uh, what loam does on a day-to-day -day basis, how we uh, uh, how we bring these technologies forward. So your left-hand side there, the hand holding an, uh, a pretty agar dish there is our, our, our isolation process. So we take um, uh, roots off plants uh, that are hosting natural fungi, natural endophytes. Um, the process we use is we surface sterilise that root with bleach and then you put that root on an agar dish and the fungus that's living inside that root uh, expresses itself out onto the agar plate and we can go, aha, there you are, there's that fungus I'm looking for. So through morphology, looking at what it looks like, um, the shape and size and growth rates and so on, we can get a bit of an idea what sort of fungi fungus it is, and particularly looking for these fungi that grow black on agar plates because they're producing the uh, the compounds, the fungal compounds that will end up being soil organic carbon in your soil. Um, but you can't tell everything through uh, morphology, through looking at uh, fungus on plates, um, tell much more by sending it away to a lab and getting the genetic code unraveled. Um, so we send it to these labs for bioinformat bioinformatics, um, which is a long word just basically meaning someone that's uh, much smarter than me can actually read the genetic code of these fungi and work out uh, what they are and what they might or might not be able to do. So in farming parlance, it's just like running a mob of sheep up a drafting race. Um, this is our drafting race, basically, to draft out the stuff that's um, not going to be useful to us to the stuff that's going to be really useful to us. We can find out lots of information from these uh, little uh, genetic codes. We can find out, um, has it got a phosphatase enzyme um, signature there? So that might tell us that this fungus is really good at solubilizing phosphorus. Uh, plant growth hormones, does it produce the right kind of plant growth hormones for yield improvement? Um, and more specifically, has it got the genes for amplified melanin production, this compound that the fungus is making that uh, turns out as organic carbon in our soils. So we sent it down this drafting race, this genetic drafting race, and before we even get to the pot stage, we know pretty much which ones are going to be really good in this space. And then obviously, obviously you've got to prove it out in, in uh, reality. So you take it to the glass house, you, run, you put it into pots. So you've got multiple replicates. You can get really high uh, data significance uh, measuring the carbon and the yield response to these fungi. And that gives you a really good indication what uh, might work out in the paddock. So from the ones that win out of the glass house, you take out into the paddock and uh, do small plot trials, which you'd all be familiar with, uh, NVT trials and so on, uh, similar sort of thing. So we put them all over Australia, all over the world, in small plot trials in a variety of crops and uh, soil types and environmental conditions to test it out, uh, to road test it, basically, see how these fungi are performing out in
Uh, look, to be having a few technical difficulties with Webby there at the moment. Um, and he yeah. might be Dan, I might, I might sub in. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> keep so, rolling so until uh, whoever gets back on. Um, righto. So, as Guy was saying, then um, going from isolation, genetic selection, um, putting it into a glasshouse trial, the next sort of stage gate um, in our product performance when we're sort of bringing new products uh, on on onto the uh, in, into market like our carbon builder canola and carbon builder. Uh, barley, we then go from our glass house to our uh, our small plot trials. So we're utilising Calix, uh, who are running small plot trials uh, all over Australia for us. Um, and these early sort of screening processes for the uh, for the small plot trials, um, we're very much looking at uh, <clears throat> a yield increase alongside of the carbon build. Uh, anything that's showing promise in our small plot trials then gets uh, moved on to the next stage stage gate, which is uh, strip trials. And essentially, our strip trial program is paddock scale. So you're looking at up to 40 hectares, utilising the grower's air seeder. Um, and we're, we're taking cores down to, you know, 30 centimetres to a metre deep. Um, and we're really trying to assess, are we still getting the same results that we're seeing uh, in our glass glasshouse trials and in our small plot trials? Is that translating to on the ground um, in an actual farm, real world scenario? Um so that's sort of the last sort of main stage gate before we go to uh, having a, a viable product um, that we incorporate in our second crop carbon program. So we might talk to this too. Um, and this is more or less the process or the mechanism. Uh, it would have been good to have Guy Webb here <laughs> as our global head of agronomy and talking to it, but uh, I'll have a crack and we'll see how we go. So... I guess through the, the process of photosynthesis, the plant's undergoing, uh, you've already got that um, mechanism where you're storing away carbon. So in the, in the process, the plant's photosynthesizing um, and it's punching down uh, carbon in the forms of sugars, so root exudates. Um, our fungi uh, are consuming these sugars that the plant's punching down in exchange for uh, nutrients and minerals and even moisture. So it's a really much a it really is a symbiotic relationship where our endophyte our, um, our carbon builder product is maintaining a symbiotic relationship, being plant beneficial, uh, and there's an exchange of resources um, for that for that uh, root exudate. Uh, in the process, um, our, our fungi is uh, producing a compound called melanin. And through this process, we're able to build more stable uh, forms of carbon through the production of this melanin. Um, go to the next slide. So here's a root um, that's been bleached, and these little lines coming out of the of the root uh, is the is the carbon order product. So being an endophytic fungi, endo meaning in and and phyte meaning plant. Um, the, the fungi, uh, the, the plant hosts the fungi and it sort of comes out from, from the root and expresses itself and essentially um, it creates an extension to that root zone where the fungi is able to go out into the soil, explore for these nutrients and minerals and able to access areas um, that the root can't because they're much finer in diameter um, and able to, yeah, it just essentially acts as an extension to the root zone and able to access areas, microaggregates and things like that, that the plant um, can't get to. Well, I Webby, you're back on, mate. <laughs> Sorry about that. My Zenify unit just died. So I'm back on uh, cellular data. No worries. So I've just, just covered off where we left off. Um, and Thanks, now we're on to the uh, end of fight coming out of the roots. All right. <laughs> Very good. Sorry about that, everyone. Technology is letting me down. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a great photo um, showing uh, under magnification the melanized endophytic fungi, the dark septate endophyte, um, growing from inside the root, uh, outside the root. So that carbon work is, uh, as you can see in this, uh, this picture, is um, that melanin being produced by the fungus 
and aggregating around the root uh, surface. So it'll extend uh, quite a fair way uh, out from the root. This is just uh, early sort of extensions, uh, but showing how that black material that's in that fungi hyphae that we're looking at now uh, was literally minutes to hours before carbon dioxide in the air. And that carbon dioxide's been taken out of the air through photosynthesis from the plant, mixing a bit of sunshine and carbon dioxide and water together uh, through the magic of photosynthesis obviously makes uh, carbohydrates, glucose, uh, which is C6H12O6. Um, and then those carbohydrates are fed down into the fungi and the fungi are using that glucose as an energy source and converting that glucose into melanin, which is C18H10N2O4. So you're going from carbon dioxide, one carbon atom, to glucose, which is six carbon atoms, down into melanin, which the fungi are making, which is 18 carbon atoms. And you're quite literally going from a gas, CO2, to a liquid, C6H12O6, glucose, to a solid, which is the melanin. Uh, so you, it's a solidification process, if you like, of uh, uh, and concentration process of carbon dioxide down into something uh, that we call soil organic carbon in the soil. So um, what excites me about this is that um, up to we sort of started really working hard on these fungi, that building carbon in soil was just about adding a whole heap of organic matter into the soil and stand back and somehow some magic happens and hopefully some of it turns into organic carbon uh, without much more sophistication than that. But with this actual process, you can see this is the actual biological uh, mechanism for carbon sequestration. This is how carbon sequestration actually happens um, at a high rate um, in, in soils. This is the deposition of carbon from carbon dioxide through to melanin uh, in our soils that we come along with our coring rig and uh, punch a hole metre uh, deep down into the soil and we can measure that extra carbon accumulation um, presented by the fungi and uh, turn it into an vacuum. The important thing about producing carbon in the soil is uh, how long it lasts. So as I say, uh, when we're used to thinking about putting carbon in the soil, it's um, crop um, residues, stubble and so on. We might uh, turn a green manure crop in um, and we're hoping that it turns out a stable organic carbon that'll stay there for a while. But more often than not, um, the normal sort of plant carbon that ends up in the top part of the soil will burn off uh, through oxidation and uh, not stay there very long, turn back into carbon dioxide and go back out into the air in what we know as the carbon cycle. Putting the intervention of the fungus in this picture uh, on the root there, um, it's turning it into a type of carbon that is really recalcitrant in the soil. Recalcitrant meaning it'll stay there for a very, very long time. Um, and through our partnership with Western Sydney Uni and uh, Australian National University, we've been able to do some really clever work with carbon tagging. So you can carbon uh, tag carbon dioxide with uh, carbon-13, a radioactive tag, and you can follow that carbon dioxide molecule from the air down through the plant and out into the soil in grow chamber uh, situations, which we've done here. <clears throat> so you can you can see on the far left hand side you've got a green bar uh, there that's controlled no fungi, and then all the others are pots that have had um, the various isolates of fungi, these melanized fungi applied to them, and the black bits of the bar that are above the green line is the carbon that is sequestered into the soil that is gonna be there for decades, perhaps centuries, and in some cases, millennia, which is what the carbon market is based on. We're getting paid to put the carbon in the soil for as long as we possibly can. Not much good putting it in there for six months or 12 months. It's gotta be in there for years and years. And through this research, we can definitively show that we can store it for very, very long periods of time. Our fungi are actually manufacturing this type of carbon and putting it in, uh, in, in the situations in the soil where it's actually going to stay there for um, a very long time. And through that process, Corbin will talk more about it in a minute, um, we can actually ask more for the ACUs being generated uh, through these fungi because we can scientifically show that it's going to be there a lot longer than normal carbon. Next slide. 
So here's a close-up of uh, some of that pot work out of Western Sydney Uni. On your left, you've got your control soil. On the right, inoculated with our fungi. Uh, it's a bit hard to see in this shot, but if you look down the on the right-hand shot um, down the bottom, you'll see that kind of uh, it look. It looks like fungi on a mineral surface. In fact, that's exactly what it is. Um, so the fungi uh, grow across mineral surfaces, and they're basically leaking melanin out of their uh, extracellular mel melanin uh, out of their hyphae, and that melanin uh, has a reaction with the mineral surface they call sorbing, uh, S-O-R-B-I-N-G, and it sorbs to the surface of the mineral and turns into what they call mineral-associated organic carbon. That mineral associated organic carbon um, has a very, very long residence time in soils. It's the longest lived carbon, um, you know, uh, apart from charcoal perhaps, um, that we've got in our soil. Um, and it is um, really important to measure because it tells us how long that carbon is in the soil. And that's something that Loam spends a lot of time and effort doing to recognize that long lived carbon in the soil, which is so important. So we tested at various scales. Um, as I said previously, uh, in this slide, we've added in um, that we do strip trials. So you go from um, glasshouse work to, out to small plot trials, um, which are all used to. Great for data aggregation and doing lots of different uh, uh, treatments so we can see which isolates doing the best in what soil types and what crop types. But then, of course, a small plot planter isn't an air seeder. Um, we want to see how it goes under full noise with you know, um, all the different things that go on uh, at sowing time uh, with fertiliser and, and, and chemicals and everything else that's used in the system under a normal system. So we do strip trials um, and they're um, roughly 40 hectares um, uh, in size, on off, on off, on off across the paddock. Um, and we do about 100 cores uh, per strip trial site. So we get really good tight data uh, out of those. And that's very real world data that shows what the grower is likely to expect um, in those soil types and under those crop conditions. Um, we've done a pilot also where we do what we are call a mock ERF, a mock project. Instead of doing a 25 year project, we, we condense it down to one year and just see what can be achieved in one year. Um, and we have a look at um, you know, just baselining it as per, per a normal project uh, as government protocol. And come back at the end of the season and and uh, do our T1 round and remeasure, and uh, that can show us what a grower can actually um, look at achieving in a real world project sense. So we have a really good look at um, you know we're trying to basically prepare um, as much as we can information wise for growers so they can make good economic decisions um, on what um, this technology can deliver to their farm. Um, so lots and lots of this kind of stuff going on. Um, last year, we did something like um, 103 small plot trials, um, lots and lots of soil tests, lots and lots of plot trials, lots and lots of data points, thousands of data points uh, all around Australia. Um, and that's all aggregated into our product development program. <clears throat> so some of the results that uh, come out the other end of this so uh, it'll be for canola and for barley and it'll be for organic carbon and yield response so barley's uh, quite a big uh, biomass producing plant um, there's a lot of carbon pumped into the soil in through a canola root um, so we're pulling numbers um, uh, five plus tons of, uh, of co2 equivalent per hectare per year um, with a with a pretty high win rate there um, of uh, we must achieve over 70% win rate before a product can go commercial. And um, with canola, we're doing that uh, very easily. So in, in terms of ACUs, that, um, that uh, over 5% increase in, 5.5% uh, increase in uh, soil organic carbon over control um, is somewhere around that 5 to 6 ACU generation uh, per hectare. Next slide. Um, so with the, uh, oh, sorry, go back a slide. I forgot um, we didn't have the yield data. So down the bottom right, you'll see we've, uh, we've got a 5.15% uh, yield bump uh, on canola as well. So as I said, that's one of the criteria for our products to go commercial. They must um, deliver 
a yield outcome uh, to the crop as well. So everyone loves a yield bump, um, but it also says to um, our researchers and our market that uh, this fungus is actually good for the plant. Um, so um, it's definitive if it give it's a, if it's giving a yield bump. Next slide. Uh, barley, uh, smaller biomass plant, um, still good numbers on uh, a 3.6% average increase in uh, above control in carbon, which is somewhere between three or four ACUs uh, generated per hectare and a yield bump of 2.9%, which is um, not massive, but if you do the ROI on that, um, it's um, it still um, gives you more than 100% return on investment on the cost of the product um, and and gives us that certainty that that's doing good for the plant, um, not bad. So these are under 22.2 conditions that were pretty soft um, and uh, you know good easy finishes and so on. Um, we're really well, I can't say we're looking forward to a bobtail spring, but it looks like we've got one. And um, so we'll probably see in our small plot trial cohort this year how this fungus takes the crop home. My hope is, uh, given that uh, melanin and these fungi are um, uh, have got traits that help with water use efficiency for, for crops, it'll be interesting to see what our data set looks like at the end of a um, bit of a dry spring uh, for this year. Next slide. Grab to your bit now, Zoe. Yeah, I think I'm on. All right. Thank you very All much. Right. Thanks, Webby. Um, yeah, cool. So I might uh, I'll, I'll talk about um, our second crop program, uh, which is how we're making our carbon border technology available through our second crop program, uh, and also a bit about the opportunity uh, that soil carbon projects present for uh, for farmers and growers. Yeah, cool. So I think some of the big opportunities that come to my mind um, when talking soil carbon projects, um, the first one is really is an enterprise stack. So for me, it's uh, very much best use of land. So an ability to to layer on a whole other enterprise on the existing operation um, without having to compromise what that primary operation is. Um, so for instance, in a cropping scenario, you got your primary income, which is your which is your crop that you're growing, uh, and then you're layering on another enterprise underneath, uh, or a second crop, um, which is your your carbon uh, your carbon job underneath that uh, that operation. Um, and the next piece that I see quite attractive uh, for a soil carbon project is it's an income diversification. So just another income stream that's coming in that's diversified from from your primary uh, operation. Um, and just recently we've seen that um, carbon projects uh, are recognised now as on-farm income. Um, it really is a commodity like no other. So and a bit of a term that we're sort of coining is, uh, you know, carbon silo. So essentially you're, you're building up this, this carbon asset, which has a lot of agronomic benefit um, in, your, in your system. Uh, however, the build-up carbon, you're, you're measuring it, you're proving it's there, um even though it's it's uh it's sold on as a carbon credit the carbon itself stays on property so it never leaves the farm gate uh i don't think there's many commodities out there that, that we grow that uh that that behave in the same way um usually in farming it's sort of um buy everything it's uh buy everything at retail so everything at wholesale and, and, and pay freight both ways so it's um quite a handy commodity to be growing um if it says in situ and we get all the co-benefits that go with it, uh, agronomic co-benefits, water holding capacity and, and mineral cycling and the rest. Um, I think it's a great way, <laughs> great way to uh, increase your operations resilience. So building soil carbon, um, yeah, absolutely great way to be building resilience in your system, not just financially with having diversification, but uh, agronomically with, you know, water holding capacity and, and everything goes with the agronomic benefit. Um, and it's a perfect uh, perfect way to integrate into your existing operation. So not having to do an opportunity cost. And I guess, too, when talking to a lot of growers in the landscape uh, about carbon projects, I guess the first knee-jerk reaction is, hang on, not, not keen to lock away country to be planting trees or taking you know, productive country out of production to be running um, a, you know, a timber, plant, uh, timber project or revegetation. 
um, a soil carbon project is a, a really good means to, to not have to have run an opportunity cost on what you're doing, but integrate that you know, fairly frictionlessly into your existing operation um, to increase, yeah, dollars, dollars per hectare. So just wanted to touch on to some of the demands we're seeing uh, for carbon credits that are, <clears throat> that are coming at us. So on one side of things, you've got the safeguard mechanism in Australia, which is essentially a piece of legislation where the top 215 uh, greenhouse gas polluters are uh, mandated to, to be lowering their emissions um, to certain levels. Uh, and every every year or a couple of years, that, that level is decreasing in a certain proportion they can use offsets, so carbon credits to offset their emissions with. So you're sort of effectively having these forced buyers in the marketplace, big buyers, um, you know, some of the biggest biggest companies uh, in Australia and the mining piece are definitely um, coming in under these top 215 uh, admitters that will be forced to, to buy these credits. Um, on top of that, I guess just the way things are going <clears throat> in society, um, you know, you've got big companies like Google, Microsoft and uh, Amazon making these big pledges of, of carbon neutrality or, um, you know, reducing emissions by a certain amount. Um, so all these pressures uh, that, we're, that we're putting on these big companies and that they're sort of uh, putting their hands up for as well, just all trending in this direction. So there's, you know, quite a big demand for credits coming um, for us. And I just think that uh, agriculture is uh, very well set up to be, you know, a large supplier of these credits. Um, I do feel that uh, that it's going to be a, a natural process. Photosynthesis, to, to me, is a natural process. It's already um, a mechanism how we build these credits uh, or sequester carbon. Um, and agriculture, you know, um, is is the largest infrastructure that's already in place um, that's, you know, with, with sequestering plants, with plants are sequestering uh, carbon through photosynthesis already. So it's, it's an existing infrastructure. Soil is one of your largest sinks outside of the ocean. So you've got the ability to store it. You've got the plants on top that are doing it already naturally. And agriculture sort of, you know, um, owns or well, controls most of that land space. So there's an existing, existing infrastructure, existing mechanism in place um, by plugging in a technology that can, you know, amplify the, uh, the build rates and the stability of that carbon. I think it's a great way that, you know, that we can take advantage of carbon markets and um, and what that can mean for for bottom line for for growers in their, their gross margin. Um, yeah, I just think that's a, that's a great way to be be doing it and very um, very complementary to to operations. So I'll just talk on here about some key pieces to be running an ERF soil carbon project. So essentially to start a project, you've got to have a new and additional practice change. That uh, that meets a meets a list of criteria. This is most of the criteria here um, that the ERF give us. So basically, the practice that you choose, you can't have done for the last five years. It has to be new and additional to what you're already doing. Um, it has to come under one of these categories on the list here. And I guess when talking to a lot of growers, particularly um, progressive growers or growers with uh, conventional growers with an open mind, um, that are practicing a lot of best best practice farming. A lot of these, a lot of these um, different categories that you can choose from for your eligibility, they're already meeting, or if they're not meeting, just won't be suitable. So I suppose where where loan really um, comes into it to assist or, or be a, um, a benefit to growers looking to get themselves into a soil carbon project is uh, by utilising the, the carbon model technology, we essentially meet that first criteria, uh, applying nutrients to meet uh, deficiencies. So as long as you've got one of these from the list. Um, satisfied. That's your uh, that's your ab ability to to enter a carbon project. So it's sort of that uh, lowest barrier of entry um, to get yourself in a, in a carbon project. Um, and here's some sort of key components of an ERF project. So essentially, when you're starting a project, you sort of uh, you've got project mapping, um, where essentially you've got your your project boundary. You uh, divide that into um, carbon estimation areas. So essentially the carbon estimation area is where credits are accredited to, and it's where you're running that eligible practice, that that additionality, that that carbon building uh, additionality piece that I just talked about in the last slide. 
Um, you have to have at least one of those per project. You can have as, you know, as many as you like. Um, and then within these carbon estimation areas with things called strata, so strata are essentially like for like uh, carbon building areas. Uh, got to have at least three per per CEA. Um, and essentially, as as our test locations or our cores, they're randomised at not only baseline but also uh, every time we go back and and sample to uh, work out how many credits we've built, they get randomised. So it's important to have really strong and really good strata at the start of the project to make sure we can really reduce the variance in our ability to measure that carbon build. Um, it can also have things in their exclusion areas uh, where you might have some timid areas or anything that's not part of the project, you can, you can cut them away. Uh, land management strategy. So I've talked a bit about that previously with the new and additional, new and additional uh, practice change. That all gets pieced into a land management strategy report. Um, and essentially where you're outlining what your, what your new practice is and how that integrates into your carbon project. Um, after these pieces, we've got the project registration. So where we're registering the uh, ERF Emissions Reduction Fund uh, soil carbon project with the Clean Energy Regulator, CER. So they're 25-year projects uh, and there's a registration piece that, that goes with it and um, administration, everything else. So in a second crop carbon project, uh, Loam, Loam helps with facilitating of, of that uh, process. Um, next, you've got your, your baseline for soil coring. So when starting a soil carbon project, we've really got to uh, assess what your, what your start point is. So where your carbon levels are before we start this new practice change so that every time we come back and do another sampling event, uh, we've got something to compare it to. So we've got the, the known amount of build. Um, and once you've established that baseline, <clears throat> every one to five years, you can come back and do the next round of sampling, which essentially uh, becomes your crediting period. So, and, and the difference is what you can uh, take to the regulator to be to be paid from once you do an offset report. Um, it's quite important to to do to a baseline as um, set that up as best you can to start, just to make sure that, that, that there's good project success and you really want a, a solid baseline. And I guess the fundamentals in getting a solid baseline is depth going to to the um, you know the, the best depth you can. We we do target around the meter mark. Um, so once that's set, it's set. So we go to a meter, we have as many strata as we can. So those are those like for like carbon building areas. Um, and the right amount of cores for your soil type. High variable soils, highly variable soils will be running more. Um, for more uniform soils, you can you can ease back a bit. Um, next, you've got your greenhouse gas emission baseline. So essentially, in the context of a carbon project, you've got to work out what your emissions baseline is the five years before starting the project uh, and working out the average. So you're looking at things like fertilisers, uh, livestock emissions, um, you know, electricity or diesel from irrigation, all these things that are producing emissions on farm, part of your scope one, um, working out what the average is. And then every year of the project, we're working out the emissions for that year. And if we're higher than our baseline, the difference gets subtracted off the credits, but if you're at the same level or lower than, uh, yeah, no credits are, are deducted. Um, so another important piece too of a carbon project is an independent external audit. So you've sort of got the the, car, the uh, clean energy regulator that's sort of the, the governing uh, uh, government body or the watchdog that's sort of um, coordinating these these projects. But additional to that, you've also got a uh, an auditor that comes in. They do their first auditor. Uh, they do their first audit at uh, the first sampling event after baseline. Um, and then I think there's another four to five uh, audits throughout the project for the 25 years. Um, so once we do our first round of sampling after baseline, uh, we've got our essentially our credits. Once we do the offset report, we get our credits. And these credits are known as ACUs, Australian Carbon Credit Units. Um, and they are issued to us through a, uh, through our annual account. So the grower will be, um, when you're a project, you've got a, an annual account, which is uh, Australian National Registry of Emissions Units. And essentially, it's a bit like a brokerage account where the credits are given to you as credits. Um, and then you've got, you know, optionality, optionality with uh, what you do with those credits. If you want to monetize them by selling them, holding them, um, you know, to sell them at a later time. 
or if you'd like to um, if you'd like to retire them against your own emissions to essentially make yourself carbon neutral. And that would mean any produce coming off your farm, if you're carbon neutral, would also uh, be zero emission or, or carbon neutral uh, produce. Um, so this slide here is what Loam Bio is offering. So this is our second crop uh, program. Uh, basically, we've got two options. We've got a standard option and a full service option. Um, and, and essentially, the difference between the two, I'll, I'll go through our full service option first. So the full service option is essentially a 70-30 split on the credits where the grower retains 70% of the credits. We retain 30%. And out of our 30%, we're funding the, the entirety of the project. So that's, you know, your, 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 not just your baselining, but all soil tests in terms of coring, uh, lab analysis, um, you know, the mapping, audit costs, uh, all costs associated with registration and sort of coordinating that project. The only cost to the grower in this um, in this option is a 50% discount on our uh, carbon builder product, which sits at uh, $25 full price. So that's a $12.50 per hectare uh, cost for the grower. On the inoculant, uh, uh, $12.50 a hectare uh, on the inoculant on just what they inoculate in every year. So if it's a 1,000 hectare project and you're only inoculating you know, 500 hectares of canola, it's just the 500 hectares at the $12.50 that were, uh, yeah, that, that, that will cost you. Um, so what else is included? Um, you've also got carbon agronomy support. So at Lame, we've got our own uh, team of uh, carbon agronomists. Um, so we'll be assigned a carbon agronomist that'll come out and just uh, not only do your land management report uh, that we coordinate on your behalf, but um, be involved in the project. So looking at other ways where we can provide value to help get you know more carbon build results. What else can we be doing other than just the end of fight to help um, you know step that process up and uh, sequester as many credits as we can. Because essentially, we're in a partnership with the grower under a 70-30 split, and um, we're not getting paid unless the grower is, because we're only taking you know our share out of the uh, out of the 30% of the credits. So we're very much in line with the grower to be building as many credits as we can. Um, yeah, and a big part of that is is utilization of our carbon builder uh, technology. Um, another thing that we're sort of um, that's probably probably fairly unique with our contracts as well and the second crop is the ability to to leave uh the contract after signing before that uh t1 event before that first round of um sampling after baseline so essentially we're allowing growers that um to be able to, to be able to pull out from the contract between baseline and, and, and t1 which can be up to five years um from signing that contract to enable them to um you know if 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 they're not feeling confident what the carbon market's doing or for any reason want to want to exit, it's giving that ability to, to exit the contract. So we're really looking at ways to really mitigate growers' uh, downside and risk in getting into a carbon project by making it as comfortable as possible um, and just really, you know, really protecting their downside on how much dollars they're having to put into this thing. Um, and the way we can do that is just really leveraging our confidence in our product um, and our ability to build carbon with our carbon builder uh, technology. Um, so I'll quickly talk about the standard options. So standard options, similar in a way. So essentially we're standing that project up, paying for all costs uh, out of our end, which is 17 and a half in this case, um, compared to 82 and a half for the grower. Um, we're coming in for the first year, paying all the costs to stand that project up. Once that project's stood up and recognised after baselining, we're, we're handing that over to the grower um, still providing the inoculant at 50% discount. Um, and then the growers having uh, more of ability to, to choose which service provider they'd like to come in um, to keep that project going uh, under a fee for service. So, you know, if they want coring done elsewhere, they can bring another um, provider in for the coring or lab analysis, um, anything like that. So we'll take more of a back seat on that, uh, on that option once we've stood the project up. Um, yeah, I'll go next slide. So here I've got a bit of a bit of a summary of how I see the opportunity with going under under second crop, um, and the first one I think a bit of a safe haven. Um, I guess just in terms of mission reporting, 
um, just what's you know possibly on the horizon in terms of um, growers and farmers being required to potentially account for our emissions. And I guess my view of that is if we're being sort of made or required, if we're going to be made or required to uh, report our emissions, you know, how far down the track until we're you know, required to, to to do something about that, if that's reduce or or pick up the bill for. Um, and I do think too, in terms of, you know, supply chain access or, or accessing not only premium prices, but just market access, um, that, 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 you know, that's, that's a possibility. Um that's coming at us. And I think being in the carbon project is almost like a safe haven where you've got not only the ability where you're, you know, put a stake in the ground where you're looking at emissions already, but also you're in a position where you can do something about it. Uh, when you've got credits coming in, you've got that ability to make yourself carbon neutral if required um, and just sort of meet what's coming down the road at us potentially. Um, so specifically for, for second crop carbon projects, I think um, the value there with, with you know, choosing loam under second crop is it's a really de-risked way for growers uh, where their downside is protected financially because um, you're not putting a lot of dollars in this thing. It's coming out of the 30% um, on our end. Um, and it's also de-risking it not just financially, but in a way that, you know, it's, it takes some of that question mark out of, am I actually building carbon in this cropping system or am I holding Um you know, it, it's sort of a mechanism that uh, that gives you a lot of confidence that you're, you're making moves forward. Um, and I think a big part of that too is, and, and Webby touched, that Webby talked about this around the uh, the permanence and stability of the carbon that we're building. Because um, I think a big part of, um, you know, measuring your carbon, if, if you're just measuring, you know, the the uh, the, recal- the, um, the labile component so you sort of your peaks and troughs part of the carbon cycle, the natural sort of carbon cycle, I suppose, peak biomass, uh, possibly got the highest carbon level. And then what does that mean over, you know, a fallow period when you're possibly your lowest when, you know, carbon cycling off under under um, under a fallow period during summer. So I guess de-risking it for growers in a way that, you know, we're, we're putting away more stable um, fractions of carbon. So your aggregate associated and your mineral associated um, in, a, in a way that you know it still might it still be that uh, those peaks and troughs for your carbon cycle. However, with sort of a, a more of an upwards trajectory in terms of incrementally building um, these stable uh, amounts of carbon, because um, I do believe that it's it's very much an offensive game and a defensive game with uh, with with building carbon. And I think um, utilizing you know um, carbon builder technology. Um, under under our second crop program, that you're really getting the best of both worlds. You're getting much larger build rates than what we think we can do in a in a in a cropping system without our product, but also the carbon that we are building um, with with work we've done with um, university collaborations, Western Sydney Uni and ANU, is that we're building the more recalcitrant permanent sort of carbon. So um, it's 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 staying there. So what we're what we're measuring will, will will stay. So that's sort of that's the way I look at it. So the the offensive game and the defensive game. And I think you get the best of both worlds with uh, with utilising the carbon builder technology. Um, the next part is larger accu generation. Uh, or I've actually already talked on that. I'll skip that one. Uh, premium prices. So Webby Webby talked about uh, you know potential for premium prices, and I guess. Um, in carbon markets, you're sort of looking at it, and there's 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 already seen where where um, premium prices are being made through you know the the narrative of how they're doing it. So if they've got you know biodiversity attached, or um, you know uh, tree plantations, or anything else that they can add to the story of, of how they've sequestered that carbon to build confidence that you know it's a, it's a premium product, we're seeing you know potentially premium prices in the marketplace. So what gets us quite excited about um, the carbon that we're building with our product is due to the the high permanence and the, and the science that we have around it and how we're doing it and our ability to be able to measure that through fractionation these three different pools um, that you know real strong potential here for for premium prices. Um, so I think that's primary the uh, the main uh, value proposition to to growers that are looking to work with us is. Um, through the use of our technology, we're, we're building more carbon, but also carbon's going to stay there. We're coming in, um, running the project end to end, 
financing it out of our 30% and then looking for the highest price that we can sell that carbon at. Um, so that's sort of how we're adding, you know, how we're trying to add a lot of value to to growers and looking to partner with us under uh, under second crop. And just to that last point there, you know, lowest barrier of entry to getting yourself into a carbon project um, by meaning that eligibility piece I've talked about previously. So instead of having to do um, something that you wouldn't otherwise like to do, for instance, you know, that might be cover cropping or or something that doesn't fit with the operation because it might be robbing moisture from your uh, your from your cash crops, which could come at a you know a financial um, burden. Um, applying the uh, carbon builder technology as a seed dressing might be your lowest barrier of entry and a mechanism to um, to get you on a carbon project without uh, without copying too much of a of a compromised your operation and taking a loss. Um, so I'll quickly talk about this one here. We ran and and. Webby, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is starting to go. Webby talked about um, this one just briefly, but essentially we ran a pilot trial in 2021. So we had a uh, a corporate off-taker come to us and give us some money to uh, to run a large-scale trial. And the point of the trial was to see if we could build carbon in a cropping system with that technology, but also to see if it was viable for, for growers that were participating in the trial, um, you know, to be to be paid in it, and would it be, you know, would it be substantial? Um, so I'll just flip to the results. So essentially, we had three different farms making up 1,100 hectares. So we had some country out at Manildra, uh, red country um, above above average rainfall for the year, well above. 2021 was a pretty handy season. Um, and the grower out at Manildra, um, yeah, was was probably conventional with with an open mind. So starting to do a fair bit in sort of um, regen space, doing some um, zero till and stubble retention and a few other few other pieces there. We're in uh, more of a conventional grower, um, working in country that was you know uh, floodplain, uh, deep clay soils, um, and a bit more. Uh, cultivation in that under that system. I think there was some offset disc into the, in in that trial, and also a bit of Kelly chain uh, going on. Um, and Lockington uh, grower out there uh, that was actually uh, Grant Sims. So as you, as you probably all know, Grant Sims is pretty pioneering in the uh, sort of regenerative space and doing some great um, great practices out there. So I think he, he was throwing a fair bit at it, fish kelp um, and everything else he does with. Uh, biologicals and some of the brews he puts out. So um, three different farms, three different management types, three different soils, uh, 1,100 hectares all up, all in canola. Um, and as an average, we got six and a half tonne of CO2E per hectare. And as we're running this trial as close as we could to an ERF project without without registering it, this is also factoring in the the twenty five percent buffer, and um, any variance calculations when we're working out that the carbon tons per as as carbon stocks. So this is what a grower would see if this was an actual uh, carbon project, um, and that would be the amount of accues. So six and a half, you know, essentially accues, uh, which is quite substantial, uh, particularly in a cropping system. Which is, um, you know, for, for building carbon cropping system can very much be one step forward, two step back, and sometimes at best we're we're, we're maintaining or, or holding. So really great numbers, um, and really putting us in the realm of of, of being quite profitable under a, under a carbon project uh, in that cropping system. Uh, that's Righto, I think that's um, just about it. Might leave it there and open up for for questions, Dan. If you've got some there in the uh, in the comment section, I think you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, Dan. I think you're still on mute. There we go. How's that? Can you hear me? Better. Ah, that's better. Um, <laughs> No, that's a that's a very comprehensive introduction to what Mike's doing. Um, we've we've seen you at the conference and and seen you at field days and stuff like that. And um, but it's really really good to sit down, um, see a PowerPoint and a, a very um, well nearly nearly an hour explanation to to what's going on. So thank you very much for your time.
Um, we've got a few questions, um, but there's a good opportunity to to type some more in. Um, but while while you're doing that, I'll just run through them. Um, do well, the first one is: Do seed fungicide treatments applied to seed to protect against smuts and bumps reduce the efficacy of the lone bio products? Yeah, me to right. that one, Torbs, do you want to do it? Yeah, I'll have a quick go and then uh, jump in if I'm wrong or <laughs> haven't touched it. So basically all of our um, products that come through to being commercial products, carbon builder, you know, canola and carbon builder barley that we have at the moment from on the pipeline, um, very early on in the stage gate process that if they're not going to play well with, with, salt, with the uh, seed chemistry that's going to be on, uh, you know, fungicides and any of the chemistry that's going to be on these seeds anyway, that's pretty much um, the first stage gate where it gets drafted out and, and thrown to the side and the next ones will progress. So very much, if it doesn't work in the real world um, by dealing with the, with the chemistry or the conditions, it doesn't progress. So all of the strains that we've got through at the moment, the, the, the two that I just mentioned, uh, Carnivore Barley and, and Canola, um, they're, they're compatible with most of the, uh, the fungicides on the market that come as seed dressings. Um, and I think vibrance from memory for, for for barley is sort of one that we just haven't been able to crack yet, but uh, fairly well the others are uh, good to go. And uh, in some situations too, having that chemistry on seed uh, is actually beneficial to to our product, where you know it takes out any competition and just allows for that um, colonisation to occur. I'll hand over to Webby if I've missed anything there. Yeah, that's pretty much got it. The, the um... The actual physical process is we put the concentration of the fungicide that um, goes on the seed onto an agar plate um, and and um, dissolve it in agar, and we put a plug of the fungi directly onto that concentration of of the fungicide or the chemical in question, and we put, throw it in an incubator. And if it grows, um, that's the highest concentration that that, that fungus is going to come in contact with. Um, so we know it's got the green light. Um, so that's a simple sort of process for us to identify um, how well our, our fungi go with a lot of chemistry. It's been quite a surprise to us that most chemicals are, it's fine with. Um, you know, there's some of the herbicide groups that we've been a bit worried about. Lontral for one in canola. Um, we know it's hard on rhizobium bacteria. Uh, that's been um, evidenced in a lot of DPI work and so on. Um, but, and so we tried it with fungi, and it turns out it doesn't hurt fungi um, at all. So there's been some surprise packages. We really thought that a lot more of the fungicide packages would be uh, would be hard on us, but it's turned out um, it's really only vibrance. Um, so yeah, it's um, but something we we have to do to make sure that the it's absolutely imperative that our fungus inoculates uh, onto the crop. So we do everything we can. Uh, to make sure that inoculation process is going to happen every time. Uh, because if we don't inoculate the crop, we don't store the extra accus in the soil. And that's, you know, how we're monetizing this thing. So a lot of our uh, science goes towards um, that inoculation process. And in reality, our QA and our um, whole process of inoculating is actually better than uh, rhizobium, so, and which it's got to be. Um, so um, that's kind of the, the principle we adhere to. Not oh, very good. Um, are you finding the inoculants are working better or worse in particular soil types or rainfall zones? Yep. So um, the basic rule of thumb is more rain, more biomass, more carbon, uh, and more so more soil fertility, more carbon. Um, so more soil fertility usually comes in the um, in the case of more clay. In the soil, there's more sites for the carbon to be stored on in clay, so you can store more carbon in clay. Um, doesn't mean you can't store it in sandy soils. You actually store it faster in sandy soils because um, the processes are kind of sped up and uh, root development is usually bigger in sandy soils. Um, but um, there's all sorts of interesting stuff we get to interrogate uh, all the data at various levels and. One of the things that comes through is that we seem to be storing carbon better in higher carbon soils than in lower carbon soils. 
um, which is uh, pretty interesting because there's a bit of science to show that that um, traditionally we've thought that that might be the opposite, but our data sets are showing um, that um, in, in our cropping soils we've been doing with our small plot trials that, um, you know, a 0.8% organic carbon soil stores less carbon than, a, you know, 1.2 or 1.3% organic carbon. Kind of makes sense to me um, that, um, you know, the better the soil condition, the better the management of the soil has been, then the more chance for a root to actually grow in biomass. And it's all about root biomass and root exudation for the fungi to have access to the carbon to turn it into something stable. So that's the basic principle. Anywhere where you can grow crops well, um, is you're going to grow carbon um, well as well. Oh, very good. Um, does the fungus or fungi colonise the soil or does it need to be applied every time to the seed? Torbs, do you want to grab that one? <laughs> yeah, I'll go yeah. you one for one. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, look, so I suppose um answer is um, we do want to apply every year to maximise, um, you know, the effect that we, we're definitely going to inoculate that that plant. So for best for best um, practice and stewardship, every every season – that we're uh, that we're sowing, we're making sure that we're putting on as a seed dressing. It's going in the ground to you know guarantee that it's there. Um, but essentially, yeah, some of the some of the strains, correct me if I'm wrong here, where we that act as saprophytes, um, and you can have that you know that that build up that colonisation effect in the soil. Uh, but to make sure that you know we can't miss, um, yeah, we like to go on every year as part of the seed treatment when you when you're sowing. The other thing to keep in mind with um, really zoned in on uh, selecting isolates that are um, really good at their host crop. So um, although wheat endophyte will uh, colonise barley and vice versa, um, there's endophytes that we've identified that are much, much better on wheat and ones that are much, much better on barley. Um, and then the canola one's different again um, and the, the pulse one will be different again. So in a rotation, um, by the time you get back to canola, for example, you know, you could be sort of four or five years later before you're back in that same paddock inoculating your canola. It's uh, unlikely that that inoculum has stayed at uh, a higher concentration in that time. Um, and it's work we haven't done yet and the work we will do and look at um, to see whether the fungus, you know, keeps growing in the soil. But mostly with inoculums, what happens is they just wash back into the background native biology and just find their place in the ecosystem and um, aren't at such high levels over time as they, you know, uh, encounter competition. Um, so purposefully inoculating at a high rate, so we put lots of spores on each seed, so we facilitate that inoculation process every single time. And um, the cost of not making sure of that is that you lose accuracy. So we just think, why, ch why take the chance? Um, and it's the same as legume inoculum. Why would you take the chance? It doesn't cost that much. Put it on the seed. Make that magic happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with your trials before it got commercialised, um, you were wanting to hit a 75% um, win rate, um, which you were hitting. But what what was – or could you identify anything that was actually causing um, – the inoculated trials to be less than the the control strips. Yeah, so some of that was um, the positioning of the trials. Uh, so a couple of them got waterlogged um, and various things. Um, some of them are question marks still. Um, so we're um, interrogating those data sets a lot more deeply to see whether there's any commonality. So we're looking at. Uh, different nutrient ratios, um, uh, residual chemistry um, that we may not have taken enough notice of at the start. What you know, whether it had a group B applied a couple of years beforehand before the small plot trial went in there, um, or you know something like that. Um, so there's a yeah, range of things that we're looking at, but um, sometimes uh, yeah, it, it, sometimes it's inexplicable, and we've still just got to keep digging and delving. Um, and that's part of the process, I guess, as we evolve. We're, we're actually only live for um, three years, this uh, project so far. So 
it's been hyper warp speed just about to get uh, two products to market in such a short period of time, uh, just because we're throwing a lot of money at it and a lot of uh, collaboration with other research partners has allowed us to do that. But uh, as we go deeper and deeper into this project, those kind of questions, um, you know, are high on the agenda to answer and make sure that our strike rate just gets higher and higher. So as, as the, the deeper we understand this little critter. Yeah. Yep. I don't know whether you've got anything to add to that, Paul. So. Oh, no, you, you covered off pretty well. No, very good. Um, so we'll talk about the the actual sampling itself. Um, how are you guys doing the sampling for your your projects, and what what depth are we measuring our carbon to? Yeah, cool. So with um with our strip troll program, which is you know full scale, as well as um our carbon projects through second crop, we're really looking to get down to you know at least a meter. Um, and I guess the reason is wherever we've got a root zone, um, you know, we, we do we do think we can build carbon there just based off, you know, how our product works as that extension to that root zone. Uh, and often when we're going around, you know, we're seeing canola roots down to that metre mark. Um, so it's really not wanting to leave any any credits on the table. Um, why would it, you know, you, you're not leaving anything on, or anything behind on the table. We're going down to that metre mark. The other side of that too is, um, carbon that's built away, you know, uh, at depth, from, you know, 30 centimetres to a metre, it's pretty well um, protected. It's going to take a fair bit of, of uh, tillage to, to get down to that, um, to that carbon that you've stored there. So it's fairly safe down there um, and just not wanting to leave, you know, credits on the table. So, yeah, very much looking to get down to that, that metre mark. Uh, ERF projects are required to go in 30 centimetres. But um, we find a lot of value in, in going down to that, that full metre um, and taking the samples off as, as two samples, 0 to 30 and um, 30 to a metre. Not very good. Um, the very, very interesting results in those pilot trials that you had that you showed there, Torben. Um, when, when were they sampled? Were they sampled immediately before and immediately after the crop was harvested or did they take into consideration the fallow period as well? No, yeah, that's that's right. So it was fairly well baseline uh, before the uh, before the air set to come in and then um, taken, you know, fairly well after the uh, fairly well after the um, header come in to, to strip it off. So it's one season. Um, so it's just just shy of it, yeah, under a year anyway. So we haven't, yeah, there hasn't been that that fallow period uh, period uh, in, in that in that result. No. And to caveat as well, for that six and a half ton, that was 2021. And most of those sites uh, were above, you know, above average rainfall. So there's a certain proportion of that that'll be uh, constituted to, to how well the crops are looking and, and, and performing with biomass. Um, but uh, yeah, so still, still very uh, pleasing results. Um, and it's to note too that all those small plot trials that 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 guy was going through, they're all um, baselined um, and then sampled again the same same sort of same way. However, it's all against a control. So all those measurements there in terms of our build rates and yields are all against a control. Uh, however, the uh, the large scale 1100 hectare trial we did was just a, a baseline um, at harvest and, and then a, and then a, a T1 after uh, a baseline at sowing and a, a T1 at harvest. So just a, a single year. Yeah. Not very good. Um, we haven't got any more questions in the QA. So, um, we might wrap it up there, considering that it's been a little bit over an hour now. So, um, really like to thank you, Torben and, and Guy, for your, your time today. Um, and I guess if uh, anyone wants to get in touch with you guys, you'd be able to find your details on the website. Yep, very good. Thanks so much for having us, Sam. Ah, very good. And if you did miss anything or need a recap, um, we will be uploading this onto uh, our Vic No Till YouTube channel. So uh, we'll take a week or so to get it organised, but we'll we'll get it up there as soon as we can. Thanks, Foxy. Very much appreciated. And thanks, Amy, for pulling all this together.
Thanks, team. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Thank you. Bye.